Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and possibly good evening, distinguished uh, participants and Zoomers. Uh, most welcome to this session four of the African Regional uh, Review Meeting, which has the title Mobilizing Resources for the Sustainable Development in African LDCs. My name is Anders Berlin. I'm the director for the Least Developed Countries Investment Platform at the U United Nations Development, uh, Capital Development Fund, UNCDF. Our mandate is to primarily support the least developed countries, and we do so with grants, loans, guarantees, TA, and market research. Today, we're going to try to solve one of the more difficult challenges we face in development finance. No matter how you look at it, the financing gap to reach the SDGs in the least uh, developed countries is huge. The Sustainable Development Solutions Network estimated the gap to be 400 billion US uh, dollar per year for the lowest income countries. Of course, this is a rough estimate and there is no exact science to estimate the financial needs. But what we know is that it's huge to reach the SDG objectives set for 2030. But do not despair. We have an excellent set of speakers and panel in front of us. So I hope, uh, I have great hopes that we will find some interesting ideas and solutions. And most of all, keep you all awake. So please sharpen your pencils, open your notebooks. There might be some <clears throat> brilliant ideas out there which you don't wanna uh, miss out on. We will start uh, this session with a keynote address by Susanna Moorhead. Susanna is the DAC chair of OECD DAC. And after the keynote, we will have uh, the pleasure of a key intervention by the Minister of Finance from Malawi, Honorable Felix Mluso. After his intervention, we will turn to a panel consisting of uh, first, Augustus Flomo, Deputy Minister for Economic Management at the Ministry of Finance in Liberia. Then we have Rola Dashti, Executive Secretary at UN's Economic and Social Commission for Western Africa. After her, we will hear from Ms. Preeti Sinha, the Executive Secretary for UN's Capital Development Fund. She's followed by Theo Yong Yungong. He's the Head of Program at Afrodad. We will then turn to the private sector and hear from Mr. Admaso, Mr. Admaso Tadese, the Managing Director of the Trade and Development Bank. And lastly, but not least, we will hear from Sara Sesvanyana, the Executive Director of EPRC in Uganda. You hear a very well composed panel with representation from LDC governments, the UN, civil society and private sector. Uh, and we have three women and three men. So nothing can go wrong there. We will let the panelists answer some questions in two rounds and each time the answers cannot be longer than through two and three, two to three minutes. These discussions will take us up until around 9 a.m. New York time, 3 p.m. European time, and 4 or 5 p.m. if you are, depending where you are in Africa. And we will then open up for questions or comments for about 35 minutes, and then we will return to the panelists for final comments. You will see a question and comments chat function on the bottom of your screen. Please type your question there. You may have a question to the speaker or to any of the panelists. And if you want to post a question to a specific person, please write the name and then the question. There is also the possibility to raise your hand to get the floor. I hope all of that is clear so we can uh, get going. I want to first welcome Susanna Moorhead. She's the duck chair of the OECD. Uh, OECD. And before she took up this post, she has been the British ambassador to Ethiopia and Djibouti and UK's permanent representative to the African Union. Susanna, the floor is yours. Anders, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and thank you for the, for the invitation. To, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of such a, a distinguished panel. Um, and to participate in, in such an important meeting. I, I was thinking back, I think it was at Unger in 2019 when I had the opportunity to talk to the least developed country group. And I was just reflecting on 
on what a very, very long time ago uh, that feels like, even though, of course, it was only uh, about 18, 18 months. Um, so I think what I'm not going to do is to tell, remind ourselves just how awful the COVID pandemic has been. We know that. Uh, and we know, sadly, that it is having a disproportionate effect on the poorest and most vulnerable people in, in, in every society. But of course, in the least developed countries, they will be hardest hit because they don't have access to what healthcare is available. They are the first to lose their jobs um, in the informal sector. Um, and the women amongst them, they're, they're already very, very heavy burden of caring and responsibility and multiple roles will have intensified many, many times. Um, there, there is uh, increasingly stark evidence just how much COVID is intensifying poverty and inequality. And again, it seems like a very long time ago when I think rather um, uh, blandly and if you like in an unsubstantiated way, we were saying this is a pandemic that respects, um, and it makes no distinction between rich and poor, uh, between men and women and between and across borders. Um, clearly, there is a huge differentiation about your, your, your vulnerability um, and, and tragically, it is the poorest um, who will be the hardest hit. So it comes no surprise. Um, we used to talk about the sustainable development goals being off track. We now have to talk about them being in reverse. Um, and, and I don't think there is any way around that. Um, and as mentioned, the funding gap, um, and, and let's face it, that, that is, is widening. Um, so what, what can we do about this? I, I really, I'm, I'm delighted that we have um, such a balanced panel um, that, that you know, myself representing uh, the DAC donors, um, honorable ministers, members of the private sector, because my top, top message is we can only do this if we have effective partnerships across all sectors and across all borders. Uh, I wish I could say to you that, that, that ODA could resolve this, but it cannot on its own. Um, and, and if ever there were a, a, a call to action uh, to break down the silos between the public and private sector, between different forms of finance, between development and humanitarian interventions, between the health and other sectors, it is here and, and, and it is now. So the very first thing we have to do is to honor our commitment to make this extraordinary vaccine available to all who need it. And I think Dr. Tedros at WHO, who I, I'm honored to, to regard as a former colleague, um, you know, has not pulled his punches on this. And there is a very, very clear message to the world coming from a leading African saying, we must not have vaccine nationalism. We must make this uh, miracle drug available to all who need it. Um, and I, I am delighted to say that, that our DAC members have uh, so far provided the lion's share of funding to COVAX, which as you will know is, is, is this global coalition that, that will help to roll out the vaccine. So that's the first thing. If we don't do that, then I think we as um, leaders, as professionals, um, as people who, who have platforms like this will justifiably be criticized for having failed the poorest in the world. The second thing, and I think this is particularly pertinent for the African continent, is the long, long shadow this will cast. Uh, particularly on Africa's youth, who of course are the majority of your population, what it means for their education, what it means for their livelihoods, what it means for their employment prospects, what it means for their futures. There's a massive job to help the economies recover, but also society and politics. We need to, to make sure that when we talk about building forward better, 
and greener, that we're not just talking about the economy. We're talking about the whole of society. So first of all, let me say something about, about financing. And, and you know, I'm, I'm going to be honest here because I think we need to know the scale of the problem we're facing. It's fair to say that at just at the moment when needs are greatest, the financing picture for sustainable development looks pretty bleak. Um, and that is for a number of reasons. Odor volumes are more or less stable. Uh, we, we don't have the figures for 2020 yet. We will have them, them shortly. Um, I'm delighted that um, a significant number of DAC members have managed to maintain and even increase their ODA. Some have not. Um, others have been very creative in pulling forward resources from outer years of reprogramming, of making the ODA that we do have work as hard as, as possible. Um, but ODA is, is an increasingly small proportion of overall financing. And what is striking, for example, is how remittances have collapsed. And that's not surprising that remittances to many, many African countries have collapsed during these crises, as those people who were sending them have, of course, lost their jobs. Foreign direct investment is right down. Levels of, of, of trade, as we know, have been affected. So it doesn't matter which economic indicator you look at, um, the picture is, is, is bleak. And in pretty much every country, certainly in, in all DAC members, public resources are under very, very severe pressure. It's therefore not a surprise that at least 100 million people have fallen back into poverty. And I say at least because we don't really know. And I think what we also don't know is what the long-term consequences of this are gonna be. And there I, I, I would just pause to think about what that means for the education of little girls. If they've been out of school for a year, we know the transformative power of education for, for all children, particularly for little girls. But if they're not in school, they are more likely not to return, to get married early, to have early multiple pregnancies and so on and so forth. So we, we need to make sure that we're not just looking at headline poverty figures. ODA to, to least developed countries um, has, has been going down uh, long before the pandemic. I mean, it, it, between 2011 and 2019, it, it declined from about 44 billion to about 43. Um, but I do think that uh, there, there is a, an opportunity now, a moment, and I really hope that we can um, collectively make this plea that it is least developed countries who need the scarce resource that is ODA more than ever and, and more than other countries as demand goes through the roof. We talk about this a, a huge amount in the DAC. Um, I mean, yes, ODA has, has its limits, but the DAC does bring together the biggest donors of concessional finance for development, about 153 billion in 2019. As I said, we don't yet know what last year looks like, but we're hoping it'll be more or less stable. And don't forget that DAC members are also the biggest financers of IDA at the World Bank um, and of all the UN agencies that do so much to reach the very poorest people in the poorest countries. And as you would expect, and as I said before, DAC members are right up at the front in supporting COVAX and the vaccine rollout. And when our ministers met last November, they redoubled their commitment to the least developed countries and to ensuring that recovery from the shock of COVID is spread equally and that it's not just in uh, the, the, the better of countries and that we build back better. So to do that, we have got to work in partnership and in my view, extend the partnership. We've talked for years about the need for additional sources of finance and other sources of finance. The time for talking is over. We have got to bring in the private sector. I'm delighted to see the private sector here today. We know it is hard and tough and risky to invest 
in some markets? How can we work together to do that? How can we use instruments like guarantees? How can we work with governments to improve investment climates? How can we support local entrepreneurs? This is not just about foreign investment. This is as much, if not more, to do with African private sector companies, particularly SMEs, those that, that generate jobs, because the way out of this crisis for Africa is going to be through employment generation for young people. And how can we do that in a way that also supports the planet? I think we hear a huge amount about uh, building forward greener. There is a lot of work to be done to put the flesh on the bones of what that means. But one thing that has struck me during the whole COVID uh, crisis is that even though many, many countries for understandable reasons have turned in on themselves, as have families and communities, people have lost loved ones, they've lost their jobs, they're worried. But what we are hearing, particularly from the youth of the world, is that they want us as leaders to do more to protect our planet and to protect their futures. So this is something that as we design the recovery, as we think about how we can work together to deliver it, as we work in partnership, we have got to have those green solutions right up front. And Africa is a land of opportunity in that respect. There is so much that can be done. The price of renewables is tumbling. The opportunities to, to, to really make Africa the green and prosperous, and yes, electrified continent, I think with, is within our technological grasp. If we provide the political commitment and we work with the private sector to get the resources flowing. So we have to make the odor we have work harder. We have to combine that in creative ways with other sources of finance. We need to work better together. We need to invent new partnerships. We need to redouble our commitment to development effectiveness principles and to extend those to finance for uh, climate sensitive investments. I'm, I'm constantly struck by the absence of development effectiveness principles in many of the community. And that is a, a, a real priority of the DAC this year to make sure that, that we uh, correct that. So in closing, let me just say that, yes, money matters, but it is not the only thing. There is technical assistance, there's expertise, there's sharing. I had a really interesting conversation earlier this week um, with the Indian government. India has a population of 1.3 billion and they are rolling out vaccines. I think every country in the world has something to learn from that. They are producing generic vaccines at, a, at a, an affordable rate. We have a, a, an Arab DAC dialogue and I talked to them about stepping finance this. We do need money coupled with the political commitment and the delivery capability. African countries also need help on domestic resource mobilization. At the end of the day, a stable, sustainable recovery will be when economies in resources. And there is a huge amount of expertise available in my own organization at the OECD. We have a, a, a group called Tax Inspectors Without Borders, but also many, many DAC members are providing expertise through, um, through, through ODA um, and through triangular operations, for example, with, with the South Africans. So let me close here um, and to say, this is a moment to be bold. This is a moment to think out of the box. This is a moment of all for in the 20 in the United Nations and elsewhere that we can build forward better and greener and we can do so for the least developed countries and the very poorest women and men within them. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Susanna, for a very, uh, very strong say, uh, uh, statement. And I, I'll, what I take away from here is, uh, is, you know, we can only do this in partnership across borders and across sectors. I think that is, is a very true statement of yours uh, that I'll keep with me. So, so thank you again. Now, we're very fortunate to have a very distinguished lead discussion today. Honorable uh, Mr. Felix Mluso, Minister of Finance uh, from Malawi. Honorable Minister, you've heard from the duck chair about some of the challenges and opportunities. What opportunities do you see in resource mobilization for the LSCs in general? And more specifically, what is done in Malawi? Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much you know, for inviting me to this um, you know, a conference. Uh, inadequate finances are one of the major challenges that most LDCs are faced with. In most cases, our tax base is lean due to a huge proportion of market operating in tough to get an uh, informal sector. Access to the international financial markets is costly, non-existent, or limited due to an availability of unqualified sovereign credit ratings. Furthermore, some of our countries that are on economic programs, such as the extended credit facility uh, with the IMF, are prohibited from accessing a concessional financing, uh, even when concessional financing is not available for mega projects with impact in our economies. It is therefore paramount for LDCs to develop innovative ways of mobilizing resources for sustainable development. In the new domestic revenue mobilization strategy for Malawi, you know, for example, Emphasis is on incentivizing the informal sector to bring them into the formal sector for tax purposes. For instance, government established credit financing facilities that could be accessed through associations or indeed cooperatives. Establishment of these cooperatives is one way of formalizing most uh, SMEs through which government will be able to track all operators for tax uh, purposes. A good collaboration with the private sector uh, constitutes another form you know, of innovative finance. This is not, a, not only limited to public private partnerships or PPPs, as direct financing of government projects, even those in the social sector without any future cash flow is possible. The Malay government is working on a number of projects that will be fully financed by the private sector uh, through issuance of long-term bonds. Government is also in discussion with local financial institutions to consider direct financing of some government projects, including roads with toll gates, as these will assist government in repaying back such loans. The Malay government is, is also focusing on enhancement of its internal processes and abilities to leverage and take full advantage of international support. For instance, emphasis is on effective use of development resources by aligning them to our national development plans. Further, public finance and financial sector reforms are also key. This includes development of adequate financial and national payment infrastructure. The new Malang Integrated Financial Information System, uh, which will be you know, fully rolled out on 1st July 2021, is integral to this uh, process. In an environment characterized by fiscal risks emanating from natural disasters, uh, we are investing in risk transfer financing instruments, including sovereign insurance. Nevertheless, 
Uh, since most disasters transcend borders, risk pooling mechanisms are needed, uh, which will ensure lower premiums. Uh, this is my intervention uh, on what was said earlier on, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, I think we got some great examples, both how your government can support the private sector with private sector instruments, but also how the government takes responsibility for re reforming the public sector to become more efficient in its use of scarce resources. So, so, so great examples there. Thank you very much. I, I now want to turn to the, to the panelists, but before doing so, let me quickly reference two documents to highlight the importance put on resource mobilization. The Istanbul Program of Action states the following principle. Ensure enhanced financial resources and their effective use for least developed countries' development, including domestic resource mobilization, ODA, external debt relief, foreign direct investments, and remittances. The Addis Abeba Action Agenda talks about resources in relation to the SDGs. They, the AAA document states that official development assistance, ODA, remains crucial, particularly for countries most in need, but aid alone will not be sufficient. The uh, Adidas action, uh, action Agenda addresses all sources of finance, public and private, domestic and international. It recognizes that finance is not just about financing flows, but also depends on public policies that strengthen the national and international enabling environments. Obviously, adequate resources were, in the, were identified uh, in both of these documents as key to achieve the goals, uh, graduation of LDCs and achievement of SDGs. So we can conclude that resources are crucial and simplified one can say that there are two ways for a country to mobilize resources. Firstly, it can make use of domestic resources more effectively and efficiently. Secondly, it can make sure to attract finance from outside of the country, ODA, foreign direct investment, remittances, etc. And Susanna uh, Moore had uh, talked about those uh, flows. So, with, uh, with that perspective, I want to turn to our first panelist, uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister Augustus uh, Flomo. Uh, we've heard from the Minister for Finance for uh, Malawi just recently. It would now be uh, uh, interesting to hear what actions the government of Liberia is taking to attract external capital to your country, including creating an enabling environment. And if you can focus on attracting external capital now, we will come to the domestic resource mobilization in the second question. Uh, Deputy Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, honorable ladies and, uh, and gentlemen, your excellences. We are, we are the government of Liberia. We are grateful to you for providing this opportunity for us to discuss issues around resource mobilization as LC, LDC's uh, countries. For us in Liberia, uh, the issue of attracting uh, foreign capital uh, remains very critical to our development agenda. As many of you will recall, Liberia has been a donor-driven country for over the years since after our civil crisis. So our reliance on foreign capital uh, ODA has been very, very strong uh, in the context of ensuring that we sustain a kind of growing economy that will be able to eventually become standalone or independent in the context of being sustainable. So foreign capital uh, injection remains very critical to us. Few things of concerns that we've tried to, to address as a nation, as, as Liberia. One uh, has been around our concern about business climate. So in the context of uh, the business climate, we're looking, we're looking at where we can be able to ensure that the, uh, the business environment is friendly enough to attract uh, people who 
uh, usually will have capitals and willing to invest in Liberia. Liberia has a number of potential for investment uh, in, 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 especially in the private sector, where we looked at, uh, uh, we are rich in natural resources, uh, you know, mineral resources. We are rich in iron ores and diamonds, uh, gold. Uh, we also have uh, timbers and, and forest products. So there's there's a lot of attraction that 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 can attract a lot of uh, foreign foreign capital. The issue has been and continue to be a uh, conversation around of uh, developing a feasible, suitable environment that promotes uh, business good business practices. And that commitment as a government, we have tried to keep to ensure that people who have resources, who are interested in looking for a place to make an investment can find Liberia as a home for, for conducting investment. Um, the, the second thing we've also looked at, which, which, which is uh, concentrating on foreign, foreign capital, but from the point of uh, foreign, foreign, uh, foreign aid, has been the fact that uh, aid in Liberia for most part has been uh, the foundation for implementing programs and projects uh, by NGOs, by our development partners, by um, different uh, uh, CSOs or that's, uh, civil, civil society organizations. Uh, and we realized that um, over the period of intervention, I'll just give you an example of between 2013 to 2020, we received, Liberia like received in total of $3.2 billion, uh, which, which cut across various projects, including energy, uh, roads, infrastructure, health, and, and many others. In, 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 the, in the context of implementation, uh, we realized that uh, there have been a lot of impact, yes, there have been impact uh, by this investment, in this foreign uh, uh, intervention, but we also realized that there have been a number of gaps. Uh, and, and the gaps have come because of the fact that most of the development partners working to support the development agenda of Liberia have not been speaking to each other. So you, you realize that there's been a number of disconnect across programming and, and project designs. So, and, and then at the same time, there's been a challenge of how alignment of, 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 of international uh, uh, aid money uh, is, is, is kind of done with, 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 with the perspective of what the National Development Plan is looking at. So for example, the government will have, will prefer modalities like giving budget support where they're you know, kind of matching all direct resources into a particular program that the government has and, and that be implemented by government ministries and agencies. There could also be what we call sector budget supports or we will have what we call reimbursement mechanism, which could also, so these are different modalities that we, we've established to be able to attract those resources. So foreign, foreign resources are critical. And, and in order to be able to keep those resources coming and to ensure that the benefits thereof I, 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 I accrue by the state, it requires a lot of commitment. And this is why I, I listened to the, uh, to the OEC, uh, OE, uh, uh, CD's uh, chair. And she mentioned earlier, very critical, that partnership, strong partnership, strong partnership, which promotes mutual respect for each other and programming in a way that provides consensus in what we want to implement and, and be able to achieve uh, over a period of time that we all agree as partners is, is very critical. And, and in, in that light, the deployment of those resources who either create an opportunity for the private sector or the opportunity that will be created who enhance to create more jobs for the private sector so that private sector is able to make more contribution uh, into the development landscape of, of, of the nation. So foreign capital uh, uh, injection in our economy, for example, for Liberia, is, is very critical. We, we, had to, we had to lose... Uh, a couple of inflows, especially in 2017, when OMIL, which was the United Nations missions in Liberia left, where we had over 15,000 troops and, and civilians in Liberia working. So there were resources inflow coming into the country that helped the economy to keep the economy, to
to keep it balanced up and to keep it, you know, kind of stable. The macroeconomic environment was a, a lot more stable when those, you know, resources uh, of foreign capital was was in both whether we were from the international uh, or foreign aid or whether it came from foreign direct investments. As, as we speak now, we are still moving towards those directions to attract more uh, uh, international entities. But again, like we all mentioned, uh, the, she mentioned earlier also that COVID has then become, as we all know, is, is, now, is a health crisis, but it's also a huge economic crisis, which has also uh, affected people, businesses, and, 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 and agreements that what governments around the world have made with, with foreign direct investors who would have otherwise been in these countries to do business to support the economic viability of those economies now are deprived or they, they, they are unable to continue those investment programs. So uh, I believe that foreign capital is critical, but the design of those programs have to be designs that have to be really, really strong in the context of what the country wants and what the country needs and in the context of what the partners also want or what the investor is looking up to. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy Minister. Very interesting and, and good to hear that you're working on the business climate and, and your views on, on capital flows. And, and we'll definitely come back to this in, in our discussions to hear more views. So thank you very much. I now want to turn to uh, uh, Rola Dashti. Uh, you're the Executive Secretary for UN's Economic and Social Commission for Western Africa. Uh, and previously, you have been the Minister for Planning and Development and Minister of State of, uh, for Parliamentary Affairs in Kuwait. And you were also one of the first women to be elected to the Kuwait Parliament. I know the Arab LDCs had a similar event last week, and I wanted to hear from you if there were any specific outcome from that meeting which you would like to share with this audience, and particularly if, you, if there were any good ideas that could be replicated for, for other LDCs or all LDCs. And I also heard was a discussion about setting up a coordination mechanism to attract funds to invest in LDCs. So Rola, maybe over to you for, for your intervention. And please uh, keep it to two, three minutes uh, this first round if you can. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to the discussion. Uh, and, uh, into it. Yes, uh, a week, last week we had convened uh, uh, our forum similar to what you have. Let me point out that in our region we have four Arab countries that are also African countries, which uh, most of them are African countries that sh share the LDC category. We have Somalia, Sudan and Mauritania in addition to, Yem to Yemen. The uh, the meeting that we had uh, was to gather the views and perspectives of LDCs and ESQA donor members. We brought also the Arab countries that are donors and supporting the uh, LDCs. And the important thing is that we identified common position between the countries of the Arab region to support the design and implementation of the future plan of action for the LDCs. Uh, our process included uh, an analytical overview of the progress, progress and challenges that is made, built on the lessons learned from the Istanbul Program of Action Decade to provide key findings and recommendations for the next uh, decade. We, we succeeded in providing a platform for the countries to agree on concrete, targeted, and effective cooperative recommendations that will assist the Arab LDCs to overcome structural challenges. And also we provided a space for discussion of the current support provided to the LDCs by Arab states and the international and regional community. Uh, let me tell you some of the findings that we had the salient recommendation. We focus on the humanitarian development peace nexus. We found it's a very important principle that needs to be led the discussions. And for the success of the triple nexus, we think that number one, ending conflict should be a priority to mitigate increasing humanitarian needs. And the security, humanitarian and development agendas must reinforce one another during the pre and post peace phases. Also, in addition to the emergency humanitarian aid, 
we think aid must be provided within a long-term sustainable framework, leading directly and rapidly to inclusive development investments and therefore contributing to sustainable peace. Another factor is we found out is that the success needs also, we need to strengthen the efforts to build, rebuild or support pre-war institutions and strengthening the administrative capacity at the central and local level to better manage transitions from the humanitarian and conflict to peace and sustainable development. And I, I've been, I want to share with uh, our colleagues, Susanna and the, the ministers talking about uh, regarding financing. And I do agree with Susanna, eight uh, ODAs are not enough uh, to support uh, LDC countries uh, to recover forward better and, uh, and to be on the track of achieving the SDGs and the development uh, uh, agenda. And one of the issues that we are at ESQUA are promoting in terms of increasing the financing uh, space is that uh, uh, during our analysis, we felt that uh, other stakeholders, in addition to the governments, needs to play a big part of it. And in this, we found out that uh, we are promoting what we're calling a national solidarity fund. And that solidarity fund is that we are bringing the, the richest people in the country, the 10 top richest people, to create a fund that is targeted and tailored towards uplifting the poor and supporting, creating opportunity for the poor. So the fund we are trying to push forward is, is not a taxation, but it's a fund that the top biggest, uh, largest, uh, richest people that they manage a fund, but that purpose of the fund is to create opportunity and uplift the poor from their poverty uh, uh, into it. And, and this is a contribution also from other stakeholders, not only the government, with the aid of the government in supporting uh, on the implementation of the fund, but it is practically the rich consolidating the rich with the poor and integrating them so there is a solidarity from, from the perspective of a shared responsibility uh, of it. In addition, we on expanding the financing space uh, for, uh, for the LDC countries, we are uh, calling for some extension of the DSSI that the G20 have approved, but we're calling for their extension till the end of 2021. Uh, to give some relief and space uh, and have some liquidity for uh, for uh, LDC countries to address and mitigate the COVID impact. And further, we are pushing at, as a UN also for the issuance of a new SDRs, also to in, uh, increase the liquidity space for the LDCs and the highly debted middle income countries in our region. And uh, not only the issuance, but also to reconsider the redistribution mechanism while you're doing the new issuance of it. And uh, so that we expand the liquidity space. But in addition to that, we're trying to call upon is that increasing the liquidity space for the LDC countries needs to be also targeted and conditional on, on, on supporting the vulnerable groups, the SMEs, not only it's a blank, open uh, uh, liquidity space increasing it, but is a targeted liquidity space increasing uh, into uh, the relief uh, uh, for it. And uh, finally, we at ESCO also, and in terms of increasing the liquidity space, we have launched also a debt swap, debt SDG swap mechanism so that to also to support uh, member countries in, in releasing uh, their debt obligation, but targeting it to climate uh, action, because we, we do believe that recovering forward better needs to have green transition into it so that we can create decent jobs and sustainable job and a sustainable development with an inclusive uh, dimension to it. Over. Thank you very much, Roel. I, I think we got uh, a, a, a row, a number of different concrete actions that you're taking. Very impressive, I must say. So it would be interesting to hear more about the, the, the details behind them. So thank you again. I, I'd now like to turn to Ms. Preeti Sinha from the UN's Capital Development Fund. And let me first acknowledge that Preeti only been with the organization for a week. 
But on the other hand, she's been working advising UN agencies for long. Priti has a very relevant background for this session. She has been the CEO and president of Financing for Development, LLC, a specialist development finance firm focusing on resource mobilization, donor relations, and innovative capital markets. She's also worked with resource mobilization within the African Development Bank. I want to ask you, Priti, we're seeing challenges in the mobilization of resources, maybe specifically to the LDCs. So, so what kind of changes, if any, are, are needed in the development finance architecture to mobilize more capital flows toward LDCs, in your view? Thank you. Thank you, Anders. And first, let me greet uh, all the ministers, excellencies, uh, colleagues, heads of institutions uh, on this uh, call. And really delighted to be here and be part of this process of uh, mobilizing resources. So my focus uh, as the incoming uh, executive secretary of uh, UNCDF, I would like to focus on the C or the C of UNCDF, the capital. And in that context, capital making it more catalytic and more into the capital markets. So referencing the OECD DAC chair, um, UNCDF definitely plays a role in trying to make ODA more catalytic and I will talk about this uh, in a later phase about our work on blended funds, which Anders, you manage, and on uh, local uh, development finance, municipal finance, which my colleague uh, David uh, Jackson manages, and then on digital finance, which um, Henri Dommel manages. But um, just to say, I'm coming from another panel this morning uh, in this process of uh, the COVID impact. And uh, the interesting part was, the, the, the discussion, let's take blended finance for the LDCs. So there was a point that the deal size remains small. So we want to aggregate the deals. We want to maybe aggregate and bundle um, the deals or the facilities to make them larger. So a colleague who runs a blended fund gave an interesting example that a person, he took, spoke to an institutional investor managing $90 billion um, dollars with only seven people. And she said her minimum ticket size is a billion dollars. So, you know, you have that kind of institutional private sector money on one hand, and we have our investment opportunity on the other hand. So maybe uh, there's a question of size and scale and how do we aggregate and bundle things um, together. Um, at the same time, uh, there was also the discussion that a first loss tranche when we are blending and ODA is, uh, you know, being innovative in uh, providing this first loss that the institutional investors, private sector are still um, wanting about almost a 50% first loss tranche, which is, a, which is a not the, perhaps a, um, a viable option in the sense that to be catalytic, I think the 20, 25% first loss tranche is more than enough. So those were some of the kind of discussions that were going on uh, in terms of um, the catalytic role of ODA. But uh, we continue to believe in it, and we believe that um, uh, a multilateral uh, like the United Nations and the UNCTF, we will continue to play this catalytic role of grants, loans, and guarantees and try to unlock uh, the markets for our LDC colleagues. And it was, it was wonderful to hear the comments of the ministers are very much aligned uh, to this agenda. And um, one of the things I would like to propose is uh, perhaps a new narrative, you know, in this LDC five uh, process, which is the fifth UN conference for the LDCs, that I would like uh, more of a global roadshow of the LDCs virtually at this moment, where we expose the countries and the ministers, the leadership to the investment funds, to the institutional investors, have our donors on the same table. So maybe a sort of a triangular tripartite discussion but a direct um, sort of dialogue. So basically a new narrative is what I believe is needed. Um, you know, and this is to overcome the kind of the risk perception as we kind of see it, um, but to convey uh, at the same time, the returns um, potential. And I think investors uh, need to be um, uh, maybe exposed or informed about this uh, risk return um, ratio that we feel um, Again, as a role as CDF, if we guarantee it, then the risk goes down and the returns remain for investors. And of course, we do this in partnership with our donor countries who support us to do this. So those are some of my thinking on the, on the catalytic role 
And um, coming just to the capital market side, I would also like to mention it's time that we consider the positive and negative externalities of doing or not doing financing. So for instance, climate change, there will be many negative externalities if we don't um, you know, tackle investment into climate change. And therefore, I would like to see our capital markets look very different in the future and in, in a year or two post, uh, you know, well, what we've experienced in COVID and having a, the great reset in 2021. So I would like to see more countries, uh, more of LDCs come to global markets, um, maybe um, investments um, structured um, like the, you know, the IFIM bond was done many years ago. It's the International Finance Facility for Immunization, where donors staggered their payments and um, the investment banks were able to issue a bond. So innovation on the capital markets would be another priority for me. And uh, we've seen, um, for example, on, um, on, uh, on, on biodiversity, as an example, uh, a rhino bond being issued, a 50 million rhino bond, which investors bought. So I would say those are the two big uh, thought buckets for me in terms of the development finance architecture on catalytic, being catalytic and on tapping the capital markets further. Uh, and uh, in that context, I would really look forward partnering both with the LDC countries and with our donors. Thank you, Javier. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Preeti. And, uh, and, and two uh, interesting proposals, a global roadshow uh, to overcome risk perception in the LECs and uh, an innovative uh, new type of uh, capital markets that have appetite for other type of instruments than today. So thank you very much, uh, Mistina. Moving on to Afrodat. Afrodat stands for the African Forum and Network on Debt and Development and is based in Harare, Zimbabwe. Dr. Theo Yong, uh, Yonggong is the head of programs of Afrodat. Dr. Yungon also have a very impressive history and has been working with the UN system in Cameroon, done consultancy work in South Africa and conducted research and teaching at several universities. Uh, Dr. Yungon, debt is of course closely connected to a country's available resources. Um, you get the capital in, of course, you get massive uh, 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 funds to, uh, to spend, but then you have to spend uh, 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 to uh, pay the principal and interest, and that, of course, uh, dig into your fiscal space. So, so what policies would you recommend to governments and possibly donors and IFIs that provides the debt in order to reach and, and maintain a sustainable debt load in the LDCs? Uh, Theo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anders. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you to all the panelists for their rich presentations. And uh, actually, like you rightly said, that is, has been a development resource, but the problem we have had at the level of uh, the less developed countries, so least developed countries in Africa has been how to invest you knew their debts. And um, there has been this talk on concessional lending and concessional borrowing, which actually has been dried up due to the strong emergence of, uh, of uh, private loans and bond issuance. But, you know, concessional lending and uh, concessional borrowing itself is not enough without, uh, prud I mean, without prudent investment choices with debt resources. Uh, without investment in good uh, uh, enhancing uh, activities, especially uh, revenue generating in, uh, uh, investment in revenue generating infrastructure and uh, other capital investments that can support uh, long-term uh, debt servicing in, uh, in, 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 le in the least developed countries. You know, this compares to a situation where, this suggestion compares to a situation where Previous uh, use of debt resources has gone in more into, you know, spendship purposes that do not really support the potentials for uh, least developed countries to, you know, to, to boost their debt servicing uh, potential. Then one thing that we at Afro that we really suggest policy suggestion at level of Afro that has been about, you know, uh, responsible borrowing and responsible lending. That is why we at Afro that we came up 
with the African Borrowing Charter, which is very important document, you know, motivated by the need, you know, to balance the public debt levels in African countries as a, a, a Dutch, I mean, at, at, at a sustainable level. And this document is available on the App Product website, and we have distributed the, this document widely within our network. And uh, we at Afrodat, we keep emphasizing the need for African countries to borrow wisely and for the lenders to all, also lend, you know, not for, for, for you know, not predatory lending, but lending with uh, the intention, you know, to support development processes in uh, the least developing countries in Africa. Then this takes us to the issue of uh, predatory lending, like I mentioned, which is, uh, uh, which we find instances where, you know, people are lending to, to, to have a hold of natural resources. I'm talking about, you know, resource back loans, where natural resources that could have been leveraged, you know, for the common group have been mortgaged. For, for, for loans in some African countries. And uh, we'll also talk about, you know, win-win debt restructuring mechanisms. We went through the peak and uh, that has not really de de delivered the development benefits that uh, many African countries and many least developing countries in Africa were anticipating. And it has not really solved the recurrent problem, you know, of debt crisis facing many African countries. And today we talk of the G2, G20 initiatives. We are talking about the debt uh, uh, servicing suspension initiative and the G20 common framework. You know, these frameworks are quite welcome, but debt arrangement based on the win-win partnership that have the potential to enhance growth and uh, ensure long-term debt sustainability is the way to go. What we as Afrodat are looking for beyond this G20 initiative is uh, a, a framework or uh, uh, a partnership that will, you know, lead to a, a long-term resolution of problem of recurrent, you know, of debt crisis in African countries. Then African governments as well, they have a responsibility to play, but uh, the bilateral and multilateral development partners also have a role to play, you know, to protect the development interest in the uh, least developed countries. And some of our speakers have made mention of the need for frank partnership between least developed countries and the advanced industrialized countries who are the major bilateral creditors, as well as you know, frank partnership with international financial institutions with the aim of you know, collaborating on win-win principles that can deliver, you know, the, the development opportunities that uh, uh, the majority of the citizens in the least developed countries uh, uh, are waiting for. And this should involve moving away from old narratives that have not only, that, you know, have not really worked for the least developed countries. Uh, we are also talking about international financial architecture that often leaves, you know, the interest of these countries in the sidelines. So I'll say there is a range of policies that we can suggest, but the most important thing that the thing we should bring back or should bring to the mainstream is uh, the issue of, uh, you know, uptake of policy suggestions. Many of the things that we say here have been around for several decades, but the political will to take up, you know, those policy suggestions to advance the development interest of, uh, least developed countries ha actually has been left on the sidelines. And I think this is time, it is high time we should, you know, come back to this debate on how to ensure that uh, policy suggestions don't only end up in the shelves, but uh, they are actually implemented, you know, for the development interest of the least developed countries. Thank you. Um... Uh, thank you, Theo, very much for that. I uh, took away responsible borrowing uh, for productive use and responsible lending, meaning uh, not overburdening the, the country. So I think these are, are, are nice takeaways from your interventions, among others. 
So thank you very much. I now want to turn to the private sector representative, uh, the managing director for the Trade and Development Bank, Mr. Admaso Tadesi. Mr. Tadesi has helped the bank grow its assets from 1 billion US dollar to 7 billion US dollar over, over the nine years Mr. Tadesi has been with the bank. An impressive record, I must say. You've also been successful in attracting institutional investors to the bank's products. Mr. Tadesi, can you explain to me the silver bullet you have used to attract capital over the years? How have you done it? And maybe you can describe the landscape you see out there and how to navigate as a banker in Africa today. Uh, Mr. Tadesi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Anders, uh, and greetings to all. Good day to everybody. And it's a pleasure for TDB to be here in this very important conversation. Uh, very briefly, I will just jump straight to the, the points that we would like to convey from the TDB experience. Uh, first of all, uh, we are a PPP in form in the sense that we are a regional bank that has both uh, public and private capital embedded in it, embedded both in the, in the risk capital, the equity structure, but also in, of course, in the debt financing aspect as well. Uh, very briefly, uh, one of the things we've been embarked upon is uh, reforms uh, driven by innovative uh, measures that we felt was possible to actually generate this blend that we now have within our capital structure. And, and, and really, innovation has a number of faces uh, for us. Uh, innovation, of course, had a lot to do with uh, reforming the capital structure of the institution and making it possible for private investors to come in and be part of uh, the capital and part of the growth and the financing that we would then uh, provide to many of our markets, which are LDC economies. And, and so uh, what it meant uh, essentially was uh, to, to, to understand the requirements of private investors and to tailor a capital structure and a, and a, and a set of opportunities for them to invest alongside us uh, in deals, but also, of course, to, to be part of our own risk capital structure. And so we came up with novel uh, instruments for shareholding. Uh, we've actually had a lot of success in creating what we call Class B shares. And what we did is we realized that the institution, when it was first formed some 35 years ago, uh, in, the in the context of COMESA by COMESA uh, member states, we realized that there was always going to be limitations in terms of how much public sector capital we can bring in. So we, we, we managed to convince our stakeholders to, to release the bank from a very narrowly defined uh, formation. And we basically invited pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, and, and other specialized uh, financial investors into the capital structure. And, and of course, we offered them, offered them a value proposition that was, uh, you know, determined based on a carefully considered uh, risk reward uh, value proposition. But, but over and above that, we also offered them an opportunity then to co-invest and co-finance various types of SDG investments, including trade. And, and so that would give them that blended triple bottom line. And, and so in, in essence, uh, it was driven by innovation and reforms. And of course, making sure that we had fit for purpose uh, opportunities for institutional investors. And that's how we were able to, to move from 1 billion to 7 billion on our way to 10 billion. Uh, we have uh, managed to convince African institutional investors, African pension funds, African insurance companies to actually take risk alongside us, not just to lend, uh, but to actually be part of uh, that, that critical risk capital piece. Uh, but then once we achieved that, we were then able to, to reach out to institutional investors outside of Africa, including in Europe, over and above Asia, which has been in the structure for quite some time. And we managed to bring on board European investors who came in and took risk, you know, alongside uh, the existing investors in the bank. But then they also said to us very clearly, now that we're a part and parcel of your vehicle, we would love to do much more in the region on a risk-adjusted basis because now we have an idea that you, 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 you kind of know how to do risk-adjusted bankable business. And so now we have a syndication functions. We, we were able to, to club deals. We're able to, to crowd in the private sector, various types of institutional investors to deals in a way that was not always possible. And it all, it all 
boils down to credibility and and of course building a a, a you know a an attractive value proposition uh, that would that would really be uh, something that institutional investors can believe in. And and so that was really the, the the story. There's a lot more that can be said, but in the time frame that we have available, I'll stop here. Thank you, Anders. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Tadesu. And and I I really think it uh, touches a more, more, some of the things that uh, Preeta Sina said about innovative capital markets and trying to find the products that attract. Um, uh, um, uh, the, the institutional investors, and, and obviously you succeeded that with also building the credibility that you could deliver on the value proposition that you're offering, and I think that goes hand in hand. So thank you very much for that enlightening intervention. Last, but uh, certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. Sarah Sesvana, the executive director of the Economic Policy Research Center in Uganda. Sarah holds a PhD in agricultural economics and have performed extensive policy-oriented research, not least on poverty, health, and education. Therefore, I, I wanted to ask you, Sarah, during the, uh, the pandemic, we have uh, uh, seen the tightening of fiscal space and decreasing external financial flows. In your view, how should the scarce resources available to be spent uh, uh, to ensure adequate financial finance of social service delivery? And what are the difficulties, difficult trade-offs a Minister of Finance need to do? Um, so, Sarah, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, moderator, and uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, is, is, indeed it is true that the uh, fiscal space is really shrinking and the rate at which it is shrinking is really, really very high, given the fact that most of our countries, we see that debt to GDP ratio is really increasing significantly. Uh, and in the case of Uganda, we see that debt to GDP has increased from uh, about 18.1% to about 41% in 20, 2019 and 20. And for 2021 is expected to move to about 49.9%. 49 and when you look at the projections for the next five years, we see that if we continue the way things are now, we are going to go beyond the acceptable levels of uh, 50% of the GDP. And this is very, very critical in terms of, uh, because before the, before the COVID, uh, we had really pressed the government that they needed to increase the uh, public spending on social services. And indeed there was a lot of discussion around that, that okay, we've spent so much on infrastructure, then we need to really to balance between the social and public spending. But before we realized this, COVID is tracking. And uh, COVID has presented a lot of, uh, I think a lot of uh, problems for, especially for developing countries. Because now when we look at the health sector alone, uh, today we are discussing the, the money for the vaccine, for the COVID vaccine and the amount of money that we need to really uh, cover everybody in Uganda is really, really very high. And uh, what we have for now can only go for about 2.5 million Ugandans. That implies that you are leaving out almost uh, about 40 million Ugandans without a vaccine. So the only alternative that government has to do in this, uh, in this period is for it to be able to borrow. But where do you borrow? That is the biggest uh, problem that we are asking ourselves. And we thought that probably if possible, we could be able to go beyond the 50% of the GDP so that you can be able to really save lives. But it is, uh, as you try to save lives, you have that your public policies, your laws, which are against all this. So that's the dilemma where, where these governments are really, are, are really struggling with. And when it comes to, uh, and uh, when you look at, at uh, tells more critically, 
because what we are seeing that most likely the HIV prevalence rates are going to go up. And when they go up, where are we going to really get this money? So it's really a big, a big challenge for, for us as the LOCDs to be able to see how best you can be able to move into this. And one of the areas where people were really that probably we should be able to look at the oil, uh, and then the oil we can be able to get some income there and so on. But again, this is may not be the, it cannot be the immediate thing for us to be able to, uh, to, to, to get the money. And here we are only talking about the health sector, but we have also the education sector. When you look at it, we, we are a bit worried but that um, at this rate, we may not be able to, um, to invest in human capital the way government had really articulated it in the National Development Plan series. So we need to be able to, uh, to think harder and see how best can we be able to, to do all this without really compromising on, uh, on the SDGs and more important to ensure that we don't leave anybody behind. Because with the money we have for the, for the COVID vaccine, then whom do you vaccinate and whom do you really leave out? So these are some of the challenges that we need to live with, at least in the short term. Thank you. I submit. Mm. Anders, I think you're muted. Sorry, sorry. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Sarah, for that intervention and, and putting that perspective also into to place when it comes to resources. So, so I'm, friends and colleagues and, and, and distinguished guests, I'm, I'm facing quite a, a small problem here. We're running out of time uh, and I really want uh, the panelists to get an, a second round. So I will make sure that you, you all have that opportunity. But I also want to make sure that uh, the audience is, is heard and, and that we get some more voices, not least from the least developed countries uh, uh, participants. So I, I will try to move to the floor and see if there's any questions. And I know there's a, a few that have announced uh, questions or comments. So I will move to the floor and then I will go back to the panelists. But before doing that, I, I, I do want to recognize that Rola Dashti needs to leave. So I, I will offer her a, a second round of, uh, of, of comments. So, so Rola, uh, um, you know, can, can you tell us a bit more about your organization and how a UN organization can help? You have heard all about these different issues in terms of resource mobilizations and challenges. Can, can you say a few words on how an organization like yours can help mitigate uh, uh, the, the, the challenges? Uh, Rola, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andres. Uh, I think uh, I, I do share uh, with the, my colleagues, the presenters on, on the issues of uh, challenges that is confronting our resource mobilization. I do agree that ODA is not enough, but I also agree that we need also governance, a good proper governance within the systems in the country. The second thing is that an important thing is the efficiency of spending, what we're calling a smart spending. We need to make sure also that the spending, government spending on social issues need to become efficient and targeted uh, into it. And this is where we are helping supporting our member states through this, what we're calling a social expenditure monitor, where, where we target and uh, uh, for the beneficiaries and making sure that the spending, the government spending is, is going in a more efficient uh, mechanism uh, for, uh, and targeting the, the right people uh, and getting uh, the maximum uh, on it. The third thing that is extremely important when we're talking about the social spending and the addressing the vulnerable groups and the social protection because of and revisiting it and making it wider. We are also uh, advocating that there is a necessity when all these social programs uh, that has been implemented, they need to look into the sustainability and uh, the fiscal sustainability of these programs because these programs at the end of the day, when you start them, it becomes an entitlement and this will create more burden if they are not sustainable and, and, and focused. Where we're trying to say, 
uh, the, the social programs and the spending need to be targeted towards creating opportunities and not creating dependencies on, 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 on the states. So the, the philosophy of the spending is extremely important. In addition, we'd like to help member states are working on to expand the liquidity issue is looking into curbing the illicit financial flows, the tax evasion issues. Uh, uh, and uh, secondly, also to, to lower the cost of remittances uh, in terms to reach out uh, to the region. I can tell you, Andres, for example, in our Arab region, where there is uh, out of the 22 countries, we have four uh, uh, LDC countries, uh, remittances into the region uh, reached around $55 billion in 2020. Uh, the LDC countries share was less than 8% uh, into it. And, and the remittances plays a big role and that we need to ensure that the cost of these remittances also could be decreased uh, uh, to allow for expanding on uh, additional resource mobilization for for uh, for uh, for the development uh, plans uh, and uh, uh, achieving. The third thing is the diversification in our resources and the economic uh, sustainability. And this is where we're talking about the gr green transformation. Green transformation is extremely important. Re utilizing innovation and digitization for green transformation that we can create also expand the processes for e creating income. For, for, for the nations itself and the resources for, for individuals. And finally, it's extremely important also to look into the rise in inequality. I mean, the rise in inequality, it creates a bigger burden on the government to sustain the proper prosperity for all its citizens. So curbing, looking into it, I mean, not only looking for increasing the resource mobilization in terms of liquidity for the fiscal space, but also proper management of and governance of your policies and your spending so that it becomes more inclusive then it becomes more divided and and uh, in creating more inequality uh, into it so financing needs to be looked into inclusive development and inclusive growth and this, this needs to become targeted and i think uh, international community and and in financial international financial institutions need to to look beyond only giving the debt or, or, or giving the loan or giving the aid, they need to target where it is and follow uh, on a targeting where this money is going to be spent to ensure inclusiveness and to ensure stability of a region. It's not only giving the governments the, the funds, but ensuring that these funds are spent in an inclusive manner so that we can get a sustainable society where shared prosperity is among everybody. Over. Thank you, Andres, for giving that chance. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Rola. And, very, and I uh, apologize, I have to leave. That's fine. <laughs> so thank you very much for your concrete uh, action points there. We're taking note, and I think uh, uh, it will be very useful for our deliberations forward. Uh, so thank you again. Now, I, I, before going to uh, 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 Deputy Minister, I want to see uh, if there's anybody on the floor. And I, I think we had a, a call for uh, the representative from Guinea to have an intervention. Uh, can I call upon uh, uh, you to make your intervention, please? The representative for Guinea. So maybe uh, uh, that person is 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 getting uh, um, you know the intervention in, in in order. So maybe I can turn to Unido and and Miss uh, 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 Calabro. Do you want to make your uh, your intervention, please? Um, yes. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I am uh, Aurelia Calabro. I am the UNIDO representative in Ethiopia and also the director of uh, a regional office hub uh, in Ethiopia. I will be very short. I've been uh, very impressed uh, for uh, the presentation from all the panelists. And um, I see that there is a call for new models 
of, uh, of uh, assisting, mobilizing resources and also um, addressing uh, um, uh, uh, development goals uh, um, in developing countries where, uh, um, where we should really work in partnership. This is a word that has uh, uh, come across uh, most of, uh, of, um, of the presentations. And in this regard, I would like to, to talk a little bit about our experience uh, by promoting uh, what we call the Programme for Country Partnership, or PCP. And the first question is, what is uh, the PCP? The PCP is uh, um, a sort of innovative model for accelerating inclusive and sustainable industrial development. What are um, the main features? Aligned uh, with the national development agenda um, is a focusing on sectors with high growth potential and it's supporting uh, countries in achieving uh, their industrial development goals. Uh, furthermore, um, we can consider it a multi-stakeholder partnership, partnership led by host government and also it builds synergies with ongoing government and partner intervention relevant to industrial development. And also is a trying um, to leverage additional investment in selected priority sectors. Now, um, just uh, to let you know, we have uh, been uh, formulating and implementing uh, over uh, 15 uh, PCPs worldwide. And uh, particularly in African countries, we have about 10 um, countries that are having, uh, having uh, this model in place. And uh, I would like uh, to mention particularly the example of uh, the program for country partnership in Ethiopia, um, where I am serving as UNIDO representative, but also as a representative of um, Africa Union and the ECA. And uh, the PCP focuses on uh, three light manufacturing sectors, agro-food processing, textiles and apparel, and leather and leather products. And uh, um, these sectors, as, as uh, many knows, are acting as a springboard for the transformation of Ethiopia economy from one based on agriculture to one driven primarily by light industries. And in this case, I would like to mention, in terms of mobilization of funding, the case of one of the flag flagship programs that is particularly impressive, uh, that is uh, meant uh, in the establishment of four integrated agro-industrial parks. And uh, these parks are focusing on adding value to locally sourced agricultural products, we should not forget that 85% that of the Ethiopian population um, is, uh, is uh, uh, involved in, in agricultural um, activities, uh, and also that Ethiopia is the largest LDCs in, 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 uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, the second highly populated uh, uh, countries in, in Africa with 110, over 110 million people. And, we'll, and is addressing constraints for private sector development. Um, just to let you know that so far, um, through uh, partnership, um, we have been able to mobilize uh, about $604 million by the government of Ethiopia, and likewise, uh, $644 million leverage from development partners. For example, in 2020, um, US dollars to 170 million have been mobilized to the EU um, multi-stakeholder initiative called the Promotion of Sustainable Agro-Industry Development that is involving also Korea, JZ, IFAD, among others, and also $100 million from the Africa Development Bank. Uh, this year we have started, I mean, it's not even finished the second month. We are working uh, in the mobilization of mobilizing something like $512 million 
for the upgrading of agricultural production and supply system around the integrated parks. By the way, two parks, one park has been inaugurated already and operational um, on the 7th of February uh, in, in the Amara region in Bure, and the second one is going to be inaugurated at the end of next week in, Siba, in Sidama regional state in the southern part of Ethiopia. Um, these are all investments um, from what we call parallel uh, financing, and until the December 22, the UNIDO PCP portfolio of projects on technical assistance programs is amounting at about $60 million, uh, involving about 39 TC projects. That's Thank just you. to share with you this experience. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Calabro, uh, for that very concrete example of how you can mobilize funding with the public and private uh, uh, funds. So, so great. I, I, I want to uh, turn back and I, I think Mr. Admaso Tadesi also needs to leave and I want him to, to get the opportunity for closing remarks. And, and then I want to turn to our Deputy Minister from Liberia as well to talk about domestic resource mobilization. So, so in that order, I will, I will call upon you. Uh, Mr. Tadisi, I, I think, you know, the question I had for you, and, 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 and maybe you can uh, 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 integrate that in your closing remark, is, is there any advice you can give to any of the other uh, development banks in, in the LDCs? Uh, you've been very successful. So what can you share here uh, for them to take take away? Uh, Mr. Admaso, uh, the, the story is yours. Th thank you very much, uh, Anders, uh, colleagues. Just a final set of remarks and thank you for the indulgence. Just wanted to say, uh, in essence, the message to other DFIs or, or financial institutions is if you sincerely reform and build it, the investors will come. You have to stick to your guns, keep up with the hard work and the heavy lifting, be very credible, but just keep, keep making the, um, the, the outreach. And eventually, if you have the right mix in terms of the value proposition, you will attract capital. I thought I would just very quickly for the, for the benefit of the practical uh, desires in this, in, this, in this seminar, just to say that to the, to the Minister of Finance of, of Malawi and also to the colleague from Uganda, we are very actively currently discussing a number of facilities with your countries, but also with others, including Ethiopia, around how we can assist with the vaccine importation. Uh, of course, uh, among other things that we're helping them with, with critical uh, inputs, for instance, fertilizer as well for some of these countries, which are very agricultural. Uh, but I just thought just from a, from a, from a mobilization perspective, we are, we'll be rolling out some new instruments and we would love uh, to have a, a follow-up conversation with uh, stakeholders who are in a position to, to really consider and help us uh, be heard in, in the money centers uh, around the OECD space so that we can actually uh, more efficiently uh, continue to raise capital. We've been doing it quite well, but we think we can do much more. Uh, we've had the pleasure of attending OECD events in the past, uh, and we're now talking to the UNCDF, uh, Preeti and her team. There's a lot of prospects on our side, and we think uh, there's a lot that can be done. This is not the forum to discuss it, but I would uh, very much appreciate uh, further opportunities uh, to offer very practical ideas and instruments that will allow us to follow through. Thank you very much, Anders. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Tadisi, for that intervention. And, and maybe the advice to other DeFi and bank in, 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 in the LCs is to look out for the, uh, uh, the, the, the banks and new instruments that they will be rolling out and see what they're doing. And, and, and there's nothing wrong in, in, in being copycat and, and do uh, things that are working from, from others, right? So great. Now I want to uh, move uh, back, come back to uh, the Deputy Minister, Minister of Liberia, uh, uh, Augustus Flomo, and, and, and you talked very much about how to uh, attract external capital in your first intervention. I now want to give you the opportunity to say a few words on what Liberia is doing to, uh, 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 to promote domestic resource mobilization. Uh, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. So, um, so I mean, let me join my my other colleagues. Uh, the 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 conversation has been very rich, and and I think uh, uh, domestic revenue re uh, generation remains 
one of the very critical issues that LDCs have to focus on. Uh, you know, because it's, it's, it's getting glaring day by day that uh, even the, o, uh, the ODAs are, are kind of reducing. Uh, we're having all the global challenges. For example, if you look at what has happened globally with, with COVID, where impact of, uh, of, 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 of economic challenges is being felt by almost everyone across the world. So the solution to, to everyone uh, now trying to fit in is to begin to look inward. And looking inward then means that we have to be able to be more strategic and innovative in designing programs that respond to our domestic revenue generation needs. So for example, what we've done in Liberia, coming from a, a donor-driven country uh, and trying to move into where we increase our share of revenue in the context of our national development program is to, to be able to, to, to structure our revenue dom uh, domestic revenue generation uh, strategy. Uh, so the resource mobilization strategy remains you know, very key for us. And in the context of the strategy, the strategy is not just enough, you know, which, which is of course a policy, then it has to go into the implementation. So looking into the implementation is key. And most times the challenges we all are faced with as LDCs in the implementation is the fact that we also have limitation on resources to deploy those very strategies that we have also, you know, we have also designed. So, so you, you can see that it's, it's a catch, it's a catch, it's a very difficult, difficult thing you have to fight to do. So we have the strategy, you want to go into, you want to look at the sector specifically that will bring more economic value. But in the context of, you know, moving into those sectors, you need the resources, you need to be able to raise the resources, whether it's domestically, whether from foreign investment and whether from, from ODAs, you have to be able to raise those resources, deploy them so that domestically the investment then becomes the base for which you can rely to be able to generate domestic revenue. So this is why most times when we're having conversation on domestic revenue generation, I like to always tie it in to the kind of uh, how do we, and, and, and our you know, uh, the fellow who spoke about, the, uh, the other panelists who spoke about debt, you know, so, so we, we, you want to generate domestic revenue, but you have to be strategic. You have to go for kind of responsible, uh, responsible investment, you know, lending that allows you to invest domestically so that the domestic economy builds itself. For example, in Liberia, we're not trying to shift into massive agriculture. We're trying to move into uh, 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 agriculture is, 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 is about 17, um, it, it's, a, it's about 60% of our employment in the, general, in the context is agriculture. But the share of revenue that agriculture gave uh, to, the, to the national envelope is about probably 5%, you know? So you see, there, there are a lot of leakages, there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed in agriculture then it is able to now become more productive to be able to make more contribution to the domestic revenue envelope. So agriculture is one case. We're looking at real estate, for example. You, you, so you're talking real estate, then you're also looking at the other side where we talk about social services. So if the population cannot even afford a, you know, a meal that day, even though you live in a house, how do you even go a, you know, after them more for real estate contribution. So you see, so it's a, it's a kind of combination of issues you have to be looking at solving problems, which we are trying to focus on to look at the real sector, look at productive areas that we can connect to in addition to all of the strategies that are looking at broadening the tax base, ensuring that uh, there's sufficient awareness, you know, so that participants in the, in the space of, of, of the tax net they are able to make the kind of necessary contribution. So domestic revenue is, is key because that's that's the way to go. As, as we're looking at LDCs have to continue to look at strategies, you know, sufficient and sustainable strategies that will help us to really increase our share of, of revenue in, in our national development programs. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. 
both lively and, and very uh, 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 informative uh, intervention from uh, Honorable Deputy Minister Augustus Flomo. Thank you very much. So, so I, 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 I want to come back to Theo, I want to come back to Sarah, I want to come back to Priti, and I want to come back to Susanna closing remarks. I, I still want to uh, see if there's anybody from the floor that want to uh, raise their voice. Uh, I, I've seen that David Jackson uh, wants to uh, uh, get to the floor. David, if, you, uh, if you're able, can you, uh, can you please uh, make your intervention and, and, and please be brief, David? Yeah, I'll be extremely brief. Uh, thank you so much indeed, colleagues, for a, a wonderful discussion with some really interesting policy uh, points. I think the point I'd like to make, is perhaps, perhaps two big points. The first one is I think it's been made quite clear that, uh, you know, sovereign debt, sovereign financing is not going to solve this problem, given the fiscal constraints. Um, and, then, and people have talked about, you know, the need for uh, also investment finance because it's it's about transformation it's not only about growing again it's about transforming and that's going to require investment so there will need to be this third pillar of um the financial architecture that can develop vehicles that can invest with long-term investment tenor infrastructure style uh, finance but not impinge on the sovereign uh, debt and the sovereign credit uh, rating. And that's going to be a challenge, but it can be done. So no time to go into the details here, but just there is light at the end of the tunnel. We are working on this with partners in a variety of ways to have this third pillar that can provide non-sovereign, uh, but long-term and affordable infrastructure style finance for the transformational invest, investment that's needed, because it's not only growth, it's transformation that is going to be required. Uh, uh, you know, as President Museveni once said, I understand that, you know, a fat a caterpillar can grow from a thin caterpillar to a fat caterpillar, but the crucial, crucial thing is to become a butterfly. And that requires transformation, which requires investment. Um, the next point I'd like to make is on the, uh, on the fiscal space, the constraints on fiscal space. This is critical for blended finance too. You know, blended finance requires a public blend and if the fiscal... So we're actually working with the Overseas Development Institute on a program. There was a, a webinar similar to this last year on the need to rebuild uh, fiscal space, domestic resource revenue mobilization, the value chains that do that. The, the, the way uh, of, of new forms of taxation to do that. And that's going to be fundamental because a strong private sector requires a strong public sector. Um, it and and you know, the, the fiscal space issue, I think is going to be critical for LDCs going forward. So unless we, ad we address that, they will slip back into chronic debt and that's not going to help at all. And that could be one of the worst legacies of COVID. So I, I think you can count on us for support in this fiscal space uh, question, as well as the transformative investment question going forward. But a wonderful discussion and thank you so much indeed, colleagues. Thank you, David Jackson. And, and maybe we didn't introduce you properly, but you're working as the director at uh, UNCDF and, and in charge of local development uh, department there. So. Um, that's uh, David Jackson. Great. So we have another uh, request for the floor before I go back to our panelists, and that's going to be the last for the floor. We, we have actually five minutes left, and I wanted us to maybe go over a bit, but not much. So, so in that sense, uh, uh, please, all uh, remaining uh, speakers, be very brief. But I, I want to call on Mamadou Dia from Senegal uh, to take the floor. Uh, Mamadou Dia, the the floor is yours. Merci. Merci, Monsieur le, le modérateur. La réalisation des stratégies de, de développement euh, des et l'atteinte des cibles ODD nécessite la mobilisation de ressources conséquentes. Donc, à cet effet, au-delà des, des efforts d'accroissement des, des ressources publiques, des ressources domestiques partout dans les paiements. On a constaté cela, que les ressources domestiques ont augmenté. Donc, il est nécessaire d'assurer une participation effective du secteur privé dans, dans le financement des projets, dans les programmes, mais également dans les réformes que, nécessaires pour la mobilisation des ressources. Donc, euh, à mon avis, c'est intéressant de repenser aussi les partenariats 
l'instrument de, de développement et renforcer les, les systèmes de, de gestion de l'aide avec un accent particulier de l'UTFMI au renforcement de la coopération sud-sud euh, et à la coopération triangulaire, comme ça a été euh, développé euh, tout à l'heure. Des pays comme le nôtre, le Sénégal, tout récemment, nous avons adopté la, la semaine passée une autre loi sur le partenariat public-privé pour renforcer encore une fois la mobilisation des ressources du secteur privé. Euh, là où je voudrais en terminer, c'est surtout par rapport au partenariat international et la mobilisation de l'aide. Pour éviter que nous revenions dans 10 ans ou dans 5 ans, au moment de faire le bilan à, à mi-parcours, de répéter la même chose par rapport à l'aide publique au développement. Aujourd'hui, quelle est la, la stratégie à mettre en place pour permettre au paiement de pouvoir accéder au, au financement international de, de, de développement? Parce que, comme on le sait, avec la, la COVID, qui a impacté euh, négativement nos économies, la mobilisation des ressources internes va être problématique si nous ne réussissons, réussissons pas à vacciner massivement euh, ou intégralement la population des PMA parce qu'aujourd'hui, le vaccin, il n'y a que les pays développés qui en ont accès. Les PMA euh, souffrent encore de, de l'accès. Et si l'immunité collective n'est pas réalisée dans les PMA, une mobilisation des ressources risque d'être problématique, surtout par rapport aux ressources internes. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mamadou Dia from Senegal. Uh, I now want to turn to our, our four uh, uh, last speakers before we end the session. And I, I want to start with you, Theo. Uh, you spoke about depth su sustainability before. Uh, maybe you can say a few words on what Afrodad is doing uh, and, and, and what you see is important in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that the governments have enough resources mobilized uh, to implement their policies beyond sort of debt sustainability. Theo, the floor is yours. Thank you. And there's um, particularly uh, in terms of uh, domestic uh, resource mobilization, I think uh, one of the challenges facing African countries is the lean tax base and uh, developing the tax base in African LDCs uh, will be one critical measure to, uh, to boost, uh, you know, internal domestic, uh, well, I mean, to boost internal resource mobilization. African countries have a very rich agricultural base and the mineral sector that has been exploited below its potential. And uh, some of these resources are exploited that give away revenue generating opportunities. And it is time, you know, to use these resources, you know, to develop uh, the tax base in the LDCs. Uh, one of our panelists uh, spoke about illicit financial flows from Africa, especially from the mineral and natural resources sector and uh, the Becky panel and the Becky report and the Fat Thai panel speak about these things every day. Uh, and they are working on this and what's left is uh, the political will and the political commitment to take up, you know, the policy recommendations to curb illicit financial flows in Africa, which is quite a very big problem. Uh, a recent UNCTAD report estimated that about uh, it's 8 billion US dollars that has been taken out of Africa, you know, on a yearly basis, which is, which is quite uh, a, 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 a considerable amount that can be invested in uh, development opportunities in, uh, less in these developed countries. Tax resources are also lost in this least developed countries to uh, tax evasion. And, uh, you know, this is a rampant problem and uh, the question remains on how to tackle this problem. And like I keep saying, it always required a political will from boot elders and from uh, Northern partners, you know, to be able to, to arrest the situation. 
and leveraging you know, natural resources in poor, de poor developmental outcomes is also critical. The resource case has never been more uh, real than uh, in, the, in the LDCs. And uh, it's high time this situation is reversed uh, to avoid uh, this unfortunate experiences. Then they reached the recent flu of uh, capital, private capital, we talk about PPPs and blended finance, but what really remains is to de-risk, you know, this instrument, especially uh, at a time when, uh, you know, uh, uh, the interest of those who own capital seems to override, you know, the common interest of people of, uh, of uh, least uh, developed uh, countries. And um, we have spoken about... Here we, we need to uh, wrap up, unfortunately, because we have six minutes left and I, I, I need to uh, distribute the minutes to each of them. So thank you very thank much you. for your intervention. Thank, I think thank you, Anders. It's great that you were uh, highlighting illicit uh, flows as well. That was one of the questions in, in the chat box from, from uh, uh, our, our colleague Giovanni. So Sarah, I, I give you uh, one minute to uh, conclude uh, uh, and, and, and uh, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to probably come back to what uh, David talked about, the new forms of taxation. And I think Theo has been able to tackle some of them where we, we talk about the extractives and we talk about the digitalization. I think these are some of the potential areas that we can be able to, to raise taxes internally. However, I think the biggest problem is the capacity to do that. Audio. How okay. exactly can we be able Thank to tax these two areas? I submit. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for being brief and for bringing that up. Uh, I now want to go to Priti. Uh, uh, so over to you, Priti, for your concluding marks. Thank you, Anders. And maybe I'll take this opportunity to outline an outcome that I'd like to see from this panel. You know, I mentioned to you, I always like one outcome that we can follow up on. And uh, maybe one from my side would be a blended fund for the LDCs that we deliberate further, uh, you know, beyond our report. Uh, what would it take uh, to really incentivize a large amount of blending finance going to the LDCs? Currently, only 6% goes to the LDCs. And so in that context, I would maybe like to follow up with OECD DAC um, and also with the countries, uh, Liberia, Gambia, um, Senegal um, and Malawi and everybody represented because we will also need the pipeline of projects. So we would like to discuss uh, your priorities, obviously, uh, the investment opportunities you see and therefore bring like the two worlds together or the three worlds together, of the, the donors uh, creating the first laws, uh, the institutional investors and the country's uh, investments. So I think that for me will be an outcome of this and we'll take it forward. Thank you very much. Excellent. So there is a, a concrete uh, proposal that we should all chew on and, and see how we could contribute to, to make that happen. Uh, uh, great. Now, now we're coming to the, to our last uh, intervention then by Susanna, who actually opened as well. And you've been listening through all of these interesting inter interventions. And, and maybe you can sort of uh, uh, reflect over what you heard and, and, and maybe see what, what you think is, is our, our, our next steps. Over to you, Susanna. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Anders. I, I, I think I'm going to struggle to reflect the richness of, of the debate. But I mean, my big takeaway is actually I'm, I'm rather optimistic. And I think, I think we need more hope and optimism at the moment. You know, there, there's a lot of doom and gloom. But what I've heard is a huge number of good ideas, um, a real commitment to a, to a multifaceted approach. And I don't think I've heard anyone say that this is either, you know, all about the private sector, all about government, all about donors, um, all about one particular actor. So, so that theme I started with about partnerships um, is, is alive and well, and we need to work on that. The second thing is this whole question of needing to rethink our risk appetite. I think the world has rethought its risk appetite with COVID. And we need to, I think, get together to uh, make a stronger international case for investment 
in LDCs. Um, and to, you know, to be honest and realistic about the risks, but, but not to sort of let investors freak out, if I can put it that way. I think it's lazy to simply say LDCs are, are too risky. Um, and I strongly support uh, what Preeti said about let's, let's think about how to get more blended finance you know, into these, these, these LDCs, because as you rightly point out, the vast majority is not going there. Um, you know, it's going to to the the slightly easier markets, and that that's not really the point. And I think, last but not least, um, a lot of people talked about governance and political will, um, and we're not going to achieve any of this unless the partnership is driven by collective political will to prioritize LDCs in in a post COVID world. Um, so look, thank you. Thank you all very much. Really, really, really stimulating discussion. And as I say, I, I, I feel very optimistic, which is, which is a very good feeling to have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. And, uh, and, and, um, and, and let's carry that uh, feeling with us all when we end this session uh, of optimism and opportunities and new ideas. It has been generated and I'm sure we will uh, try to come back to them and we're taking note etc so that is a, is a great uh, a segue to to for the, the next sessions that will come uh, following this and I'm really sorry to have to rush you in the end here and 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 also thank you for being so disciplined and, and making time to 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 come to an end uh, and we are not the end. And I want to thank you, uh, keynote speaker Susanna, Minister Maluso, who was here earlier, all the panelists for making this one hour, an hour and 45 minutes uh, a very worthwhile use of time. Uh, I also want to specifically thank the government of Malawi and the UN's Office of the High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries and Small Island uh, Developing States for arranging this session. Well done. Uh, thank you and have a good rest of your day, everybody.